Okay, good afternoon everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here. I do have slides. I have a clicker now. Excellent. I'm going to talk about emotions in science. Heavy topic. I left science, I left academia, I should say, um, a little over a year ago. And when I look back, I say to myself, wow, that was intense. <laughs> that was quite a ride. Um, so there was one PhD, um, there were two postdocs, uh, three different countries, three years of psychoanalysis, um, series of panic attacks, um, what else? Yeah, um, successful publications, um, a papers being cited over 200 times, um, a dinner with Richard Axel the week before he got his Nobel Prize, that was exciting. Um, I got through very stimulating conferences in New York um, by Henry Kissinger, Jeffrey Sachs, a very thrilling sense of belonging to something way, way bigger than me. It was super exciting. So lots of ups, lots of way, way down. So yeah, quite a ride. And this is, I guess, one illustration of, of that feeling with uh, the work of uh, Jorge Chan, who is the author of PhD Comics. If you don't know it, it's delightful. It's a great, uh, refreshing way of uh, maybe going back to, uh, for me, to the, um, the PhD, uh, P good old times uh, of the PhD. So let's work with you a little bit. How many of you, um, as a sh with a show of hand, how many of you have published a research article as a first author? Okay, fair number of you. How many of you have um, or published as a last author? How many of you have published as a last author? Yes. Well done, guys. Um, do you remember when you learned that your first paper as a first author or your first paper as a last author was accepted? Do you remember the feeling you had when you learned that? And how did you learn it? Was it over the phone? Was it receiving an email? Was it someone, a colleague, com coming, walking to you and saying to you, hey, your paper was accepted? And how did you react? Did you smile? Did you laugh? Did you jump around? Did you run to the first bar and got drunk? Did you cry? Did you call your mother? <laughs> it was probably something very intense and memorable. And I must confess, I do not remember when that happened for me, or what I did, or how I reacted to the news of my first paper being uh, accepted. Anyway, so yes, for a lot of you, it is a very uh, intense uh, emotional ride. Another example again from Jorge Chan, PhD Comics. I don't know if you can read it. In the middle it says, paper with same title, you were going to give your thesis. So there is no denying it, the conduct of research is emotional. There are two reasons for this. The first one is the career pressure. There is a huge, and a lot of people have talked about it, there is a huge attrition rate. The numbers that were mentioned earlier today, 97% of PhD students will end up outside of academia, which is raising the stakes a lot. If you define success as being part of these 3%, that's a lot to ask. So there's a huge career pressure. Second is, in itself, research is highly emotionally charged. When you're conducting research, you're exploring the unknown. You don't know what you're going to find. Yes, you think you know, you make project projection, 
uh, predictions, hypotheses, but in the end, you don't know it. You don't know what the outcome will be, which is highly unsettling. And a lot of people can't take it. A lot of, pe of people cannot uh, cope with the unknown. And in a way, you, if you are able to cope with it, that's an amazing skill. Take notes in the list of skills you have, coping with the unknown. It's a, and uncertainty. That's a big one. That's a huge one. And another thing is that the system in itself makes it very personal. When the, the token, in a way, the reward you get for your good work is a name, your name, on a scientific publication. And your goal, your goal, your theoretical goal, is to aim for first author or last author. It is very much related to your name. The system makes it so that your work, your success and failure, is very much related to your name being at the, at the top or at the bottom of a list of authors. So your success, your failure, then becomes tied to your personality. And whenever you are succeeding or failing, you, you think that it's a value, an intrinsic value of yours. Remember, research is an exploration of the unknown. It's highly unpredictable. Putting your identity on something like this, not a good idea. Really not a good idea. So, how do you cope with this? Well, one coping me mechanism is to say, well, it's only temporary especially the career pressure, you might say, well, once I will be tenured, this pressure will be gone. It's amazing how our ability to say, oh, it, it's gonna be better, yes. Right now I'm suffering, yes. When, I'm, when you are a PhD student and you are thinking that, you know, it's, it's very difficult and, and you are very miserable, you look, post-graduation and you're like, yes, it's gonna be better when I'm gonna be a postdoc. When you are a postdoc, you look further ahead and you're like, well, it's gonna be easier when I'm gonna be um, uh, on a tenure track. When you are on a tenure track, you s often you uh, convince yourself it's gonna get better when I'm gonna be tenured. It's amazing. And if you look at it, yes, these years where the career pressure is the highest, it's a short, I mean short. It is a limited in time, so you might say it's only temporary. But is it? Is it really temporary? When do you stop asking yourself this haunting question? Let me try something here. Does it work? It is silent, it doesn't work. Burning question being, should I stay or should I go? When do you stop asking yourself this question? I'm asking you, all of you, um, and I invite the younger um, uh, member of the audience to go and ask the older uh, member of the audience, when do you, stop, do you ever stop asking yourself, should I stay or should I go look for something? outside of academia, I see heads going like this in the front row. <laughs> so yes, it's an illusion to think that this problem of science is super emotionally charged only temporarily. So what are the consequences? Well, first of all, let me consider for uh, a moment, the PI perspective. Okay, if this period of time when, let's say, you are a PhD and a postdoc, it's, if it's so intense, then how do PIs deal with it? When you are in charge of a group of people who are under tremendous pressure, who are um, on the verge of breaking down every other day, how do you deal with this? How many PIs are trained as psychotherapists? 
I don't think there are that many of them. It might be useful. I don't know if you heard about this issue of mental health among um, young researchers. Well, I mean, you might think about the fact that, yes, it's, it's probably coming from all this uh, heavy uh, emotional load that there is in the scientific career. And yes, as a PI or future PI, it is worth keeping in mind that, yes, you were in this place, uncomfortable un position, being in the middle of a PhD, being in the middle of a third, fourth postdoc, um, and finally, yes, you made it to the other side and you became a successful PI. So keep this in mind for uh, when you are PI in charge of other people ready to blow a fuse um, at some point. So in, the th in my three years of psychotherapy, there is one thing at least I learned about, um, about the dealing with emotions is it is very good to talk about it. Uh, and so with my um, dear wife, Adriel LaBeouf, uh, we started, uh, we very recently created a website called tenuretrek.com uh, um, where we are, the idea is to collect stories of young researchers going through the phase of PhD and postdoc and in, into whatever career that they choose um, to take on. For me, this is a very interesting database for all of the younger people in the audience here to see what there is and to see that, yes, people are struggling a lot, and it's okay. It's okay to be struggling. You're not the only one. And it's also interesting to see how different people are coping with it. It's actually fascinating. So why is this important? For me, there is a big issue here, especially with regard to science and research. In general, emotion at the workplace, that's not something that go well together. I mean, emotion is something that is very personal and your colleagues might not want uh, you to cry on their shoulder uh, or share the joy that you had uh, when your first baby was born. It's very intimate and as um, uh, Vanya presented earlier, emotions need a safe space to be dealt with. So in a sense, science, research, academia, same as any other workplace, uh, it's, a, it's a hard place to deal and talk uh, about emotions. The one thing that is very specific about science is that we scientists claim to be objective. How do you reconcile the fact that you are doing a job that is very, very emotional and the fact that you are doing a job that is supposed to be very objective? At which point in the process do you detach yourself, you take on all your emotions, put them in your pocket, on the table, somewhere you hide them, and you, you are able to say, now I'm, obje I'm objective, I'm a true scientist. And I started becoming more and more interested in this notion of objectivity. And I started reading about it and talking uh, with people about it. And I found this very interesting uh, article called The Trouble with Scientists, um, published in a great uh, journal called uh, Nautilus. Uh, highly recommend it. Um, and this article was about biases cognitive biases in research. And there is, I just, I'm just taking a tiny, tiny fraction of that article and sharing it with you here. Um, it's a quote from Brian Nozak, who is a psychologist uh, working at the University of Virginia. He says, the most common and problematic bias in science is motivated reasoning. We interpret observations to fit a particular idea. And psychologists have shown that most of our reasoning is in fact rationalization. And for me, that didn't sit well with me. Um, and I figured that it was something that was worth sharing, talking about. And I was puzzled by the fact that nowhere in my career someone pointed this uh, to me. And then I started looking back at all the research that I had done. And I was asking myself, 
was I biased in any way in all of the things that I've done? And yes, oh yes, yes. And so I invite you to ask yourself about all the biases that you have in the work that you're doing. And obviously emotions are a great trigger uh, for biases. Especially when, you know, you need to publish in order to get, uh, a ten uh, to get tenured, if you, and publishing in order to get your PhD, publishing to get your postdoc, and so on and so on. You are uh, under a lot of pressure, and so it's very, very easy to succumb to this, uh, to this call of these biases. One very concrete example for you to consider. I am ma a man talking about emotions. Would you perceive whatever I'm saying the same if I was a woman? And I'm pretty sure for 90% or more than 90% of you, the answer would be no. So it's always interesting to look at, into your own cognitive biases and assess whether you are truly rational in any decisions uh, you are making. It is extremely relevant for science. It is extremely relevant anywhere in your life, career, personal life, professional life. Keep this in mind. So emotions can get in the way, again, in science and any, uh, in any workplace. Emotions are tremendously useful when it comes to communication. I don't know about you, but I found all the talks that I've heard so far where I found them very compelling because they were very personal. There were people talking about their own experience, their own emotional journey through their own struggles and so on and so on. And this, as a human, is very compelling, very attracting. A lot more compelling than abstract uh, concepts like DNA replication. So yes, you might have heard the word uh, storytelling and the, it, its application in science. And as scientists, very few of you are familiar with the concept of storytelling. Uh, and very, a lot of scientists are terrible public speakers because they are lacking the notion of the importance, the relevance of emotions in communication. And because they still try and struggle and, yes, pretend to be objective. Forget about objectivity. When it comes to communication, if you want to appeal to an audience, you need to be emotional and personal. And Vanya beautifully um, referred to that uh, this morning. So yes, emotions can be in the way. You can harvest your emotions and work with them. So all of this reflection on, on objectivity, emotions in science, led me to this interesting um, reflection. Is the notion that science is objective and rational a notion that is from the past, that is from, the, in a way, the 20th century? And are we entering an era where science is subjective and emotional? It's an open question. I do not have the answer. Oh, by the way, going back to, uh, I'm rewinding for, for a few seconds. In terms of communication, at one extreme, you have the scientist who is only talking about facts, uh, the expert that tells his or her audience, this is the truth. I know I'm an expert. And take it or leave it. If you don't accept this fact, you are an idiot. At the other extreme, you have Donald Trump, who is only communicating at the level of emotions with close to zero content. None of what he's saying, or close to none of what he's saying, is based on any, fact, uh, on any facts. So please do make an effort as a scientist and don't be at one extreme because, I mean, the extremes, they, they, they are there for a reason. The reason why uh, Donald Trump was elected is probably because way too many scientists have been claiming this is the truth and I know the truth because I'm an expert and without making any efforts to make this 
object here, fact, abstract, concepts, relatable to the people. So keep that in mind, whether you stay in academia or not. So then the question, very concrete for you. OK, I mentioned, I talked about emotions, I talked about science, subjectivity, and all of this. The question is, where do you fit? How good are you at coping with emotions? If you are very good at dealing with very stressful situations and you are able to handle that, amazing. That again, on the list of skills that you have, you can add that. It is very, very useful. If you, if you don't like it, if you can't take it, well, you might consider some other career, career path. I'm going to talk a little bit now more about myself. Um, personally, during my PhD and my postdoc, um, postdocs, uh, it felt like I was walking on a, on a slack line. Uh, it felt like he was very uncertain that I might fall at any time. And uh, some people might uh, have, have already asked me, um, okay, what does it, how does it feel to be freelancing? And on this metaphor, I would say freelancing feels a little bit like running on a slack line while being blindfolded. I have no idea where I'm going. Uh, it is very uncertain. Uh, the good thing is that I learned to deal with uncertainty throughout these years of, uh, of PhD and postdocs, and I learned to cope with it. Yes, it's uncertain. I have no guarantee that in six months I will earn a living. So what? I live with it, I cope with it, and I keep running on my tightrope uh, um, while being blindfolded. Another very important tool uh, that I'm using uh, in pretty much all of the things I do. Uh, so I practice it and I teach it. And this magical tool uh, is called improvised comedy. And you might wonder, how can improvised comedy help me be a scientist or be good at any other jobs? So when it comes to emotions, um, improv is very good and acting, I guess, in general, it's uh, very good to learn how to cope with emotions. You can play with emotions, you can learn, you can discover, um, and be better at coping with it. Second notion, which is very important, and I mentioned already, is learning to deal with the unknown. It is very uncomfortable to not know what tomorrow is gonna be. It is very uncomfortable to be on a stage where there are 200 people looking at you and you have no idea what you're gonna say next. It is, it is uncomfortable, but for some magical reason, I like it. Anyway, that's another story. Um, in research, again, we rarely talk about exploring the unknown and how difficult it is. You can train yourself on this. You can train yourself to be better at dealing with the unknown, and I do that all the time using improv. Improv is also just simply very good because it makes you laugh. And laughter is an amazing therapy. I have an improv group here in Geneva. We perform uh, one, every month. Uh, I practice with them, with these guys, every week. And I know that every week I will laugh to tears. It's amazing. It's an amazing feeling. So I really, truly invite you to uh, try it. Um, and another thing that I'm developing is um, an association called uh, The Catalyst, uh, based in Geneva and created by my wife, again, um, amazing human. Um, that's probably why I married her. Um, we are developing uh, improv workshops for scientists. So uh, it started five years ago in Lausanne, and I'm slowly um, uh, organizing uh, improv workshops where you just show up once a week, I'm trying to make it regular at the University of Geneva or at CERN uh, to get old scientists uh, better at communicating, better at dealing with emotions and all of this. And on that note, I would uh, thank you for your attention and welcome any questions. <laughs>